Okay. Hello and good evening, everyone. Our next speaker for the day is Sarah Collins from the Manchester Metropolitan University. Sarah is a senior lecturer on the BA Fashion Design and Technology program at the Manchester Fashion Institute at the Manchester Metropolitan University, UK. She specializes in design process, research methodologies, and portfolio communication. Her expertise includes sports and performance wear with a focus on user-centered and co-design processes. Sarah's research spans sportswear, identity, memory and lift experiences, centering on the relationship between the garment and the wearer. She has over 15 years of experience within the fashion industry, including design consultancy roles with Kangol, Doc Martin and Henry Lloyd, and senior design positions with sportswear brands Reebok and Adidas, working across Europe, the America, Asia and South Africa. Today, Sarah is going to talk about responsible design. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's, it's a real pleasure to be joining you um, at the start of what I'm sure will be a really exciting journey. Um, so are the shares, are the slides sharing? I don't know if everyone can see me. Perfect, thank you. Oops, sorry, <laughs> technical issue. Okay, so yeah, I think really I wanted to talk to you today about sort of more responsible design um, process. So against the backdrop of this global pandemic that we all find ourselves in, is now a really good time for a kind of a reset um, of fashion and how we think of fashion. A time for us to look at our own consumption of fashion um, and question that seasonal renewal, I guess, of our wardrobes. So as designers, can we explore alternative processes, ones that encourage greater engagement between the wearer and the garment, or ones that are more mindful of material resources? So this talk is going to explore some of the ways in which designers are already seeking to make more positive contributions to society and to reduce the impact on the environment. So we're also going to think about kind of how we as designers might adapt our own practice to be more responsible. Next slide, please. OK, so why if why do we need to be more responsible? Um, you know, it's it's a question that's not always easily answered, but I think, you know, when when we look at our fashion and garment industry, it's one of the top five polluters globally. So as an industry, we produce over 100 billion new garments. So they're new garments made from new fibers every single year. So a staggering 85% of all those textiles end up in landfill. And that's every single year as well. And that's 63 million tonnes. So there are, I'm sure you're all more than aware of this. You know, there are many statistics surrounding the fashion and textile industry. And most, if not all of them, are not entirely positive. So you guys who are just starting off at the beginning of your careers, this is something that you might want to think about as you kind of lead in um, to the next stage of your journey. Next slide, please. OK, so we're all really, really familiar with images such as these, aren't we? That the top one is taken from a documentary called Fashion's Dirty Secrets. Um, and it just shows the scale um, and the impact that our industry is having. Likewise, the one below um, is an image of the Aral Sea. So the image on the left was taken in 2000 and the image on the right just 14, late, 14 years later. And that shows the effect actually of growing cotton. So cotton is a really thirsty um, fibre to grow and it has dried up like an entire sea, which in turn has had huge sort of impacts on the lives of the people that live in and around that region. Um, so I think both of those show that our industry, you know, causes environmental damage on a colossal scale. 
and that our current system isn't sustainable. You know, we've dried up entire seas, we've polluted waterways that millions of people rely on. We filled oceans with plastic um, and as an industry, we contribute an incredible 10% um, to global carbon dioxide emissions every year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there's also a human cost as well. I'm sure we're all really familiar um, with the collapse of the Rana Plaza building in 2013 in Bangladesh where 1,138 people lost their lives. Um, you know, these were some of the scenes following the collapse of that. And I'm sure we'd all agree, you know, with the statements that are on here. You know, so as well as sort of polluting waterways, contributing to CO2 emissions, it, this also, our industry also has like a human cost. Um, so there's many people around the globe that rely on the fashion and textiles industry for a living, to make a living. Um, but actually, you know, the, the rights of those workers need to also be considered. So what can we do about it? I think there's a common kind of narrative that brands um, and designers sort of spin about, we'll, we'll just be more sustainable. You know, so that, that solves the problem. But actually, what does sustainable look like um, and how might we get there? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, you know, the word sustainability is so commonplace now. It's a word used frequently by brands, by designers, consumers, politicians all over the world. But what does it actually entail? So to many, it relates to the environment, to the use of natural resources, um, you know, the air, water, land, what we actually do with waste. But sustainability also includes the economy. So that's profit, um, business growth, you know, to safeguard economies, to actually support people because there's so many, you know, millions of people around the globe that actually make their money. You know, they, that's how they earn a living um, is within this industry. So society also plays um, a part within sustainability, standards of living, the right to education, um, communities, equal opportunities, also safe working conditions for people. So there's an environmental cost, a human cost, and economic factors in play around sustainability. But when, when we think of our own design practice, how might we begin to make changes to that? And how can we be part of this much bigger kind of global conversation? So just before we do that, and on the next slide, please. Before we talk about our role of, as designers, we all have another role as well. So even if fashion design isn't your discipline that you're gonna be studying, I'm pretty sure all of us on this call are actually fashion consumers as well. You know, we all buy clothes, wear them, love them. I certainly do. Um, so therefore, you know, we have to acknowledge that we all have a part to play within this fashion system. But one thing I'd like you to consider first is how much value we place on our clothes. You know, not necessarily economic value, but value of use, emotional value, and kind of attachment to the garments. So if we were all in a room together, I would have asked you to all bring in a treasured item of clothing. But as we're not, um, we're going we're gonna, to um, sort of do it in a slightly different way. So if I could have the next slide, please. So <clears throat> just a few more statistics um, before we kind of get into thinking about our own garments. So we are consuming more and more items of clothing every year. And in 2015, 1 billion units was, was sold compared to 50 billion 15 years ago. 
But at the same time, the um, number of times that we actually wear those items of clothing has decreased. So this makes sense. The more items of clothes we have, the more choice we have, the more we have to pick from, and the less inclined we are to wear an item over and over again. So as a designer, maths is not my forte at all. But, you know, even I can understand that if you owned a single pair of jeans, you would wear that pair of jeans on every occasion you wanted to wear jeans. If you own six pairs of jeans, you would split the same amount of wear across each of those pairs, maybe not equally. Um, you know, we all have favorite items of clothing, but you would have choices. So I guess thinking about um, our own clothes is a really good place to start. So if I could have the next slide, please. So <clears throat> value, what do we value most in the world? Is that something that's personal, that's meaningful, that has a positive impact on our life? Um, or maybe it's to do with economics and you value something because actually you have to save up for 12 months to be able to afford it. So we're gonna do a really, really short experiment just to consider that term value. Um, <clears throat> and thinking about actually the, the clothes that you are wearing or something in your wardrobe, um, which you value highly. So just the next slide, please. Thank you. So this could be, like I say, something that you're wearing today or something that you know is sat at home in your wardrobe. So that could be an item of clothing or an accessory, your favorite hat, um, footwear. And you might not want to do this now, but you could do it later on and just, just really sort of sit and consider, um, you know, how, how long you've owned that item and think about what you know about the item. You know, when was it made? Where was it made? Who made it? Think as well about how many times you might have worn it. Um, is it important to you? If so, why, why is it so important? Do you really treasure it? You know, consider the emotional, and the sentimental value of that item. You know, does it remind you of a person, a place, an experience? Is this an item that you're never ever gonna get rid of? You know, that you're gonna keep and treasure and pass down. So we all have items like that within our own wardrobe. You know, we're all consumers of fashion. Some of our garments we might value much more highly than others. Um, but it's really important, I think, to consider this at the beginning of your kind of design um, educational journey that actually, you know, when you are creating something, you think about the value. So we tend to measure things in economic value, but actually there's a lot of other value that you can add to a, a product. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, in the coming slides. So if I could have the next slides, please. So as consumers, we have control, don't we, over what we buy, over how much we buy, you know, whether we are buying because we need something or whether it's because we want something, you know, it's like we live in a consumerist society, seasonal trends change, aesthetics change, and there is a need and a desire, I think, to be kind of current. Um, to keep up with, with these um, seasonal trends that we, we see coming around sort of twice a year. Um, and if I could just have the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the last slide of statistics, I promise, um, but an important one. So when we're thinking about all this stuff that we buy, all these things that in future we might design, I think this is something to kind of bear in mind um, that actually all that product, all those clothes has to go somewhere ultimately, doesn't it? So these are sort of um, reasons for disposals. I could only find it for the UK, um, but by a big margin, the main reason for getting rid of an item is that it no longer fits. 
So body shapes alter over time. Um, and once an item of clothing no longer fits, it becomes redundant to us. So if the estimated life of a garment is 3.3 years, which isn't very long, and disposing of all of that, if we're consuming 100 billion items each year, it's really easy to see how, you know, we're, that accumulates kind of 63 million tonnes of textile waste annually. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So how can we be more responsible in our own approach? Um, I begin this section with a bit of a caveat. There is not one single solution. The problems in our industry are too complex and often too contrasting. You know, so in solving one problem, you, you have the potential to create another. But if we all really think about our approach to design, um, we can make changes that can have a more positive impact, you know, on sustainability. Um, and the choices that we make at the design and development stage really can have impact. So the first of these, um, next slide, please. The first of these that um, kind of approaches that I wanted to talk to you about was adaptive design. So thinking back to that previous slide, if 42% of all our garments are disposed of because they no longer fit us, perhaps one of the most sustainable ways that we can construct garments is, that, is to think about adapting the fit. So if your body shape changes, increases, decreases, actually you can customize that garment um, so that it can actually allow for some kind of reasonable variations in an individual shape. A lot of these examples that I've included in here are actually um, examples from our students in Manchester. I didn't want it all to be kind of very high level design because actually these are solutions that I believe we can all build into our practice. Um, so I think this is a really lovely example. Actually, it was just squares of fabric that you could sew together. You could take out, you know, you could increase um, the size of the jacket and you could decrease that as well um, so actually there was some kind of like transformative shape um, and fit that you could build into that design. Uh, next slide please. So um, another Royal College of Art graduate Camilla um, Dandiara, so her collection again focused on kind of transformative um, designs where the wearer could mold and shape um, garments around their body. So she experimented with different materials in 3D um, and actually used a combination of like nylon canvas, but also aluminium foil and metal, metal wiring. So it meant, um, that the whole shape could be transformed. So it's not about like small personalized sort of details like badges or patches, but actually garments that possess the ability to transform shape and fit in direct response to the wearer's kind of needs and, and wants. So again, sort of staying on the theme of um, thinking about the consumer and how they might use and engage with garments that you design. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So co-design co is a practice that you might want to think about. It's becoming increasingly kind of used um, within the in some areas, I would say, of, of the fashion industry. So this is where a designer might collaborate directly with the end user, sometimes other stakeholders, to develop garments that respond directly to the wearer's needs. So this, this role kind of changes, um, sorry, this approach sort of changes the role of the designer. So they still bring creative expertise, but actually the end user contributes a specialist knowledge around the use of that garment um, based on their sort of specific needs. So this again is um, another example from, from an ex-graduate um, from Manchester who, built a collection around kind of Arctic polar expeditions. So basically users who need clothes to survive extreme cold and they're athletes, they trek huge difference, huge distances, you know, in very, very extreme kind of environmental 
climate. So as a designer, she had no idea about this. It's not something that she had ever done herself, but actually by engaging this, the guy on here was called Charlie, who was one of those athletes. So they kind of built and constructed this collection between them. Um, so actually he brought his knowledge of the environment of actually what he needed to use the product for and the designer contributed specialist subject knowledge to that process. Okay, next slide, thank you. <clears throat> so co-design may not always be possible. If you're wanting um, designing for a broader market, then maybe that kind of like specialist collaboration isn't something that's entirely feasible. But maybe these next examples are more easily embedded within your design practice. So thinking back again to that slide of 26% of all garments are discarded because they're no longer liked, could a slower approach to fashion design be a solution? So this might seem like a really, really common sense approach to design, but even those smallest design changes can impact how long a product's life will last. So, you know, beyond a garment not fitting anymore or a person changing size, um, actually, one of the best ways that you can keep your products from going to landfill is designing to last. So this could be um, the ability for a garment to be repaired if it, if it rips or tears. Um, it could be to do with more classic styling. So actually that garment isn't as subject to kind of seasonal fashions and changes and aesthetics. You know, all of this sort of extends the use phase from an aesthetic point of view. Um, the use of higher quality fabrics are important as well. You know, sort of using really durable fabrics that are going to withstand more wear and tear over a prolonged period of time is really, really important. Um, this example is from a designer, Patrick Grant, um, who set up kind of a community initiative um, and use uses like really, really durable um, and repairable fabrics. But actually, if you look at the design of, of the garments as well, you know, you can imagine them still being relevant in 10, 15 years time. So it reduces that need, I guess, to kind of constantly have to update your wardrobe. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so I'm sure you've all heard um, and probably practiced um, the process of upcycling. So, you know, maybe deconstructing, reconstructing a garment. Um, but if we go back to that statistic of 100 billion garments being produced every single year, you know, then repurposing existing garments and materials makes a huge amount of sense. You know, it reduces... Um, the need for mass production of new fabrics. Um, it reduces the sourcing of natural materials, which are finite. Um, it has the potential, I guess, to like generate new life cycles for the garments. Um, you could repurpose a garment to fit a new requirement. A jacket doesn't always need to be turned into another jacket, um, you know, but the, the potential is almost endless. So it increases the cost per wear. So if you've created a fabric or you've created a garment, actually by extending its life, it, it becomes more economical as well as being kind of more ethical and more sustainable. Next slide, please. So upcycling as a design methodology has gone through something of a transformation of late. I think at one time when it was first around, it was associated maybe with like craft projects and the aesthetic of it almost seemed secondary to the, the process. But upcycling doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't look like this anymore. It's not about kind of patchworking and, and hand sewing. Now designers are creating really aspirational and contemporary garments from old ones. Um, you know, designer Bethany Williams is a great example of this. So she uses um, 
excess Adidas products to create really bright, bold, kind of beautiful new garments. Um, and again, you know, these are really desirable. They're aesthetically beautiful. They're, they're really sort of well-made and very expensive. Um, but I, I wanted to include her um, within this because I think, you know, she really has kind of transformed the way we think about upcycling. Uh, next, next slide, please. So um, a graduate of St. Martin's um, is another example of this. So this, um, instead of being kind of like sportswear, is actually a luxury women's wear um, label. So Germania sort of debuted his label at Paris Fashion Week. Um, and the focus here is really on kind of like luxury upcycled fabrics with really beautiful detailing, kind of like beading. Um, so this is luxury high-end women's wear. It's aspirational, it's directional. It's not kind of like patchwork and, and hand stitching, but really beautifully crafted garments, um, you know, with really high-end sort of fabrications and finishes. So it's certainly something, you know, that, that is attainable for us all um, to think about actually where we source those fabrics from. Um, just by extending the average life of clothes by two years, no, sorry, by three months, um, you know, we could really have an impact actually on the reduction of the carbon sort of water and waste footprints. So it might not seem so when, you know, you're a student, you're working on your own practice and you may be only working on one of those garments, but actually if you applied that in an industry context and you were designing a garment that was gonna be made 80,000 times, then actually you can see how, how the impact um, can be great. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, Christopher Raven, another kind of pioneer really of sort of repurposing fabrics. So Raven works with a lot of kinds of um, parachutes, kind of defunct like G, G suits from um, the military to actually make really kind of like innovative and highly conceptual garments that are purposeful, they're functional and they're, they're wearable. You know, so there's, there's a wealth from kind of like sportswear to women's wear to, you know, more, more like um, street and sport menswear examples. So there's lots of designers doing this, but doing it kind of like really beautifully. Um, so I think it's definitely something that we could all consider within our own practice. Um, next slide, please. So really, really difficult. We've just touched on it in that last section, but it's really hard to talk about responsible design without mentioning materials. You know, the growing of materials, the production phase, the impact materials have on the environment, the ecology, humans, animals, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. So again, whilst, whilst we're at, at university and we're, we're studying, we're not in charge of ordering, you know, hundreds of thousands of meters of fabric, but, you know, we can still all consider the materials that we use within our own practice. So there's no such thing as 100% sustainable fabric, you know, but some are better than others. So a couple of major sort of determining factors when labeling sustainable materials are the amount of resources that are used to produce that material and the life cycle um, of that material. So that's the growing phase, the use phase, and actually like end of life. So <clears throat> I wanted to mention the use of materials. It is by no means my area of, of expertise. So I don't want to give you a list of, of do's and don'ts. You know, it's a huge subject within its own right and would warrant a talk all on its own. Um, but I did, however, want to show you some examples of designers who have taken a stand um, on their own kind of use of materials just to get you thinking, I guess. Um, so next slide, please. 
Thank you. So all of us have that autonomy to make choices, you know, when sourcing fabrics. Um, we can make decisions on what those fabrics are made from, where they're produced and how they've been, been produced. So Stella McCartney is probably one of the first names that comes to my mind anyway. Um, you know, she's one of the pioneers of kind of eco-friendly fashion. And there are a lot of fabrics um, that she just won't, won't use. So any leathers, sort of suede, animal skins, furs, um, and instead substitutes those with like organic cottons, ethically sourced wool um, and recycled textiles, in particular recycled polyesters. Um, so I think considering our materials and choices of fabric is one of the, the simplest ways to be more responsible in our design approach. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So Katie Jones, um, another kind of pioneer of, of using alternative materials. So this is luxury knitwear. And she really takes kind of waste not want not approach by using unclaimed materials. So from manufacturers, manufacturers and consumers. Um, this is all made by kind of waste products that would otherwise end up in the landfill. So, you know, you can see these are really beautifully crafted, they're playful, they're really brightly coloured, um, you know, but by reusing these um, sort of excess products, she really makes sure that her, her designs are also addressing issues of landfill and over consumerism. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about, I guess, where these fabrics or materials come from. You know, so try and think outside of the box and think about actually if you've got a collection to make, um, you know, where might those fabrics come from? It doesn't always need to be kind of like ordered off a roll um, from a factory. Next slide, please. So future fabrics, um, not always easy to get hold of. I'm not going to labour on this too much um, but they're definitely worth mentioning you know as we begin as an industry to look to more alternative sources to kind of um, produce fabrics from. So the Milo um, is grown from part of a mushroom but sort of rivals the look of look and feel of like animal leather and um, Pinatex, which I think you can get sort of openly um, on the market is another sort of leather like material, but made from pineapples. Um, and then there are a couple of examples at the bottom of kind of like bio sequins that are made from tree cellulose. So sort of negating the need to create more and more plastic. So I think whilst you may, might not be able to use these within your design work at the moment, it's certainly worth having an awareness of um, and doing a bit of research around where, where this is kind of heading as an industry. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm aware I'm running out of time a little bit. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was kind of like how you might create um, your products. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so maybe thinking about um, alternative ways of pattern cutting, you know, if you, if you can't source more ethical, sustainable fabrics, you don't want to work directly with a user to do some co-design, actually thinking about how you might produce patterns um, to be less wasteful is a really, really interesting um, design approach that eliminates a certain amount of textile waste at the design stage. You know, by carefully sort of like planning out how you might use those materials, how you might arrange your pattern pieces, um, you can also kind of like say, save some money at the same time as you're saving sort of resources. Um, and again, this is um, an approach that you could be completely in control of as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so once we've been through all the creation, 
um, and what fabrics you might use, what approach you might take to designing, how long that garment might last for. Actually, all of those garments at some point will become defunct. They'll become no longer useful. So maybe thinking about design for disassembly is something that you would like to do within your own process. So this involves designing products um, that can be taken apart easily at the end of that product's life. So that all those components can be repaired, reused or recycled. So, you know, this would require you thinking about the materials that you use. So the fewer materials, the fewer trims that you use, actually the easier this process is to go through. So currently less than 1% of all garments are recycled in any kind of like high quality manner. Um, so you might want to think about, about this as a process um, when you're actually kind of designing um, your initial thoughts. So thinking about the fiber composition, so different fibres blended together are more difficult to separate. So if you use a mono material, like 100% cotton, it makes it much easier. If you use bigger pieces of fabric, then that's also easier to take apart because there's less sort of fiddly bits to kind of pick apart and use. Um, the less zips, poppers, trims, um, makes that disassembly process again easier and shorter. Um, you might want to think about compostable trims or recyclable trims. So choosing materials with safe dyes and finishes and that avoid kind of toxic chemicals being circulated through that recycling process um, is something again that, that affects design for disassembly. Thinking about using stitching rather than gluing or bonding um, is something that again, is, is easier to do. So sti stitching is much more friendly to this process. Um, and the labels as well. So if materials can't be identified, if you can't communicate with somebody um, who is taking that product apart, then that can make it much, much harder. So just being like super clear on actually what is in that product um, makes it much easier. Okay, last couple of slides now, thank you. So I think the pandemic has really thrown a spotlight on technology um, and how we might use that within, you know, the design process and as designers. So obviously being able to use technology kind of means you have to have access to it. But thinking about, you know, how brands, I guess, are reducing the amount of sampling that's required by using um, technology such as Clothe 3D that will simulate kind of true to life garments on an avatar. So designers have the capability to quickly sort of like test the fit, the fabrics, the colors and the patterns. Um, so this reduces um, the need for physical materials, particularly within the sampling stage. Um, but, you know, again, when you're thinking about one garment that you might be making at university, it might not seem that impactful. But, you know, if we're doing this across 10,000 units of that garment, then actually, you know, it, it can have a real sort of impact. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please. It keeps going up. So the last, the last kind of technology that I wanted to talk about was 3D printing. Um, so this is probably some of you have used this or seen some of this, have some experience of this, but it's a little like a technologically advanced zero waste process. So unlike kind of subtractive manufacturing, 3D printing only uses the materials that it needs by building garments layer by layer. So by using this technology, we have the capabilities of kind of reusing uh, plastic waste um, and converting it into like printing filaments so that we can create new products from it. So probably the most notable designer to use 3D print um, in a practice is Iris Van Herpen. You know, and these are really, really like innovative and um, beautiful garments that have been created through 3D print and laser cutting. So again, I think if you don't have 
access to this it's certainly worth you know as an aspiring kind of designer practitioner to have an awareness of this uh, next slide please Thank you. <clears throat> so when we begin to think about like the, the scope of the issues across the fashion system, from the environment to people, safety, resources, it, it can feel like wholly negative. But I really hope that this presentation has kind of inspired some ideas of how we can make positive changes to our own design practice. You know, as a host of problems has the potential to turn into a, you know, a host of possibilities. So we're not going to set out on our journey, you know, to change an entire system, an entire fashion and textile industry. But we do all have the power and the ability to make choices within our own design process, whether that's reducing waste through pattern cutting methodologies, repurposing garments to reduce the need for new fibres, collaborating with end users of our garments to create a more personal and valued item of clothing, or thinking ahead to the end of our garments life, we certainly all have control over our own design process. So last slide, thank you. So I'd like to just leave you um, with, this, um, I'm sorry about that, um, you know, this sort of message really, you are part of the future of this industry. You can't solve all of the problems, but you can think about your contribution, you know, your voice. You can offer solutions. You can certainly have an opinion. You can challenge, you can be resourceful and innovative. You can design to minimise impact, you know, you can evaluate your own consumption, you can value craftsmanship and demand traceability as a consumer. You know, be prepared to pay a, pay a fair price for the garments and the, the products that you buy and always think how you might be able to recycle, reuse, repair or repurpose those. So I will leave you with that and say thank you very, very much. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions. Apologies if I've gone slightly over um, on the timing. But yes, thank you all. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for that very wonderful and insightful talk. Uh, you've definitely probed questions on the need for responsible design in the fashion and textile industry amidst the global efforts towards sustainable practice and material, which is so vital in today's world. I'm sure we are all aware of the current state of depletion of resources, and your presentation has brought home some of these very hard-hitting facts, especially for our new design students who are starting the design journey here today. I'm hopeful that we all become more mindful of the human and environmental cost involved and look at ways to achieve this in our lifestyle habits. So once again, on behalf of UID, I thank you for making the time for our students. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, no, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to wish everyone the very best of luck. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, thank you.